Back in the 1980s, before liquid crystal television technology had advanced to the state it's in today, manufacturers were trying to uh, make a smaller and smaller CRT to make a portable set. And Panasonic did it. They had the smallest commercially made production television in the world, and here it is. What you're looking at here is the smallest color CRT television set that's ever been manufactured. We're looking at it through the magnifying lens here, and I know I've showed this off before when this unit was uh, loaned to me, but I now own this unit, so I think I can go into a little more in-depth um, look at this unit. This is a one and a half inch. It's a Panasonic, and here's the, here's the tube itself with the with the magnifying lens removed. There's a bit of dirt in here. I might be able to try and get that out, but um, it's a one and a half inch full color. CRT. Not to be confused with some of the smaller one and a quarter inch beam index tubes that were used by Hitachi in some of their video cameras which used a stripe, a color stripe system and it used an index signal which had a little sensor that sat in front of the tube to detect the beam as it scanned from one side to the other and that was used for timing. Uh, we know that this is a full uh, Delta Matrix three beam tube because you see if I bring a magnet anywhere near the set it is going to make the purity really go off you see a beam index tube that wouldn't happen it would it would cause the picture to shift around but it would not affect the colors in fact if what would happen on a beam index tube is that if you distorted the signal it would actually cause the color it, it could cause the, the color um, switching circuitry for the multiplexing to actually lose lock completely. But um, the beam index tubes like the Indexatron do not have a shadow mask in them and they're pretty much immune to magnetic interference. It'll move the picture around a bit but it won't cause the color shift because what's happening is the, the, the magnet that I'm bringing near the set is actually causing the three color beams to misconverge and land on the wrong uh, phosphorus stripe or phosphorus dot in this case because it's a delta matrix. This set here is the CT101 from Panasonic. It was uh, manufactured in March of 1985 and this specimen I've got here is actually in relatively good condition considering the age of this set. It's uh, it's in really good shape. Even the batteries will hold a charge. I, I was just When I just unplugged it from power it kept running there for a few minutes because the battery is actually taking on a charge. So let's just lift the batteries out of this thing. It runs on eight, these would be nickel, nickel cadmium cells. But uh, they're still, and it look, they look like they're just conventional batteries in here, don't they? Um, they're not even, I don't even think they're the ones with the tabs on them. Looks like they're just conventional cells that have been bundled up here. But you can see that the, the cells themselves are, you know, they probably should be replaced. But this is not something that I use to watch TV on. It's more of a novelty. I, I take it out and uh, turn it on once in a while just to see, um, you know, make sure it still works and so forth. So there's a couple of screws in here and the top will lift off on this set and as I say this thing is beautiful inside here. Look at that little picture tube. I'm just so impressed by what they've done here. What I want to try and do if I can is I want to try and take the front off to see if I can get that dirt. There's some, there's some dirt between the front bezel and the actual tube itself. And I'd, I'd like to, like it if I could get that dirt out of here. I just don't know how it comes apart. I guess it lifts off, but I think it might just lift out of here. Ah, it just clips. Maybe just clips out.
that's what something has bugged me is there's a bit of dirt in the in between the tube and the front. I just don't want to break any plastic on this thing, but I think I might be able to just get a cotton swab down there between the tube and the glass and wipe it out. And then I won't have to take it apart any more than that. I think I got it. Yes, I did. But there's the tube. Check out how thick the glass is on this thing. Even from here, you can see it. I'll probably lift this tube out. I just don't want to damage any of these circuit boards because this unit is, is, is very rare. This is probably one of the rarest small TVs you'll ever see. Because when this set was sold in 1985, they sold for about, I think it was $600, $599 US is um, what these sets sold for. Because of the price of a set this size, um, they wouldn't have sold many of these sets. And because it wouldn't have been a high volume set, the chances of them being a lot of them still around are relatively slim. In fact, I keep looking on eBay to see if one comes up and I haven't seen any come up in the past six months that I would, every so often I look to see and I don't see any of these things come up. But check out how thick this glass is. You can see how thick the glass is here on the front. You can actually see if I pull the sticker off here, the serial number sticker, here is the shadow mask right here. That's a, that metal plate there, that's got the shadow mask in it. Right here's the second anode over here on the bell of the picture tube. But um, the three electron guns are down over here. We've already confirmed that. And I, I would advise maybe to go look at the, the first video I did on this unit. But uh, where I, I lifted some of the boards out on it. But I didn't, uh, I didn't try to clean this up because I was in, originally intending to send this one back to the fellow that owned it. But as I say, um, we came to a a deal on it. Uh, the fellow I got this from is actually the fellow that uh, donated that Tectonic, Tectronic scope to me. So, um, you know, we we came to an agreement that uh, I should buy the TV from him. <laughs> got the scope and uh, purchased the TV off of him. But that is... Uh, that's a work of art. I'm thinking I might be able to improve the picture a little bit. I'm just going to check the focus here. There's a focus adjustment at the back, back here. I'll show you that in a minute. But I'm just going to try tweaking the focus and see whether I can get that picture a little bit sharper. Ah, uh, look. I can. I mean, it's not a real high resolution tube, but uh, if we can get the, the spot as... as as good as possible, and this one's the screen control. So this will affect the, this is the master screen. How we tune this thing is it's got a, it's got a Veractor tuner on this. And It covers the entire band, the VHF and UHF band. There's a switch here to select VHF or UHF. I'm on the VHF band. Now I've got uh, signals I generate in house. So I can, I've got uh, channel four, which is outputting from my, my PVR. I've got channel five, which I've got uh, it's got BC1 on it, so I've got my news channel on this. And then it goes up to, we'll hit the mid-band next. Channel 17 should come up there is where I've got my time from my little BlackBerry time generator. As I scan up, continue up, 
I have channel 7, which I've got some one of my own, my test video, which has just got the waves and rain and whatever else I put on there. This is just a Raspberry Pi playing this back. Uh, channel 9 is my security cameras. Channel 12, it's a uh, Jazz TV, as it's called. It's a channel I pull in off the internet. Can't leave that on there. And uh, that's it for the VHF band. And then on UHF, I should see channel 27, I believe, is the one I've got set up. It's just an output from a, an off-air receiver, which should be, it should be tuning into global. It should be on like channel 40. There it is. Red for VHF and and uh, green for UHF. And incidentally, these two, uh, incidentally, these two red dots you see here, that's actually the red light on the front of the camera that's reflecting. It's not, nothing wrong with the tube. But as you can see, I got that, that annoying uh, bit of dirt that was bugging me. I got rid of that. If I shine a bright light into the front of the tube here, you can actually see it's lighting up the, the inside of the tube. You can see the metal here. This is the uh, the shadow mask. And it's uh, you can see the metal tab is right up here bonded. I don't know how well it's come over on camera but it uh, It's funny because if I hit this at the right angle I can actually wash the screen out from the back. <laughs> with this light I can actually from the back here I can actually wash out the phosphorus from the back and see the internal structure of the tube I wonder if I can get a shot of that on camera but uh, I can see the I can see the shadow mask inside the tube let's see if I can get a shot of that on camera so we can identify some of the major components here of this little tube. So I've got the electron gun in the back here. These are convergence and, and purity magnets for making sure that the three beams are properly aligned. We have the deflection yoke here, which of course is quite a bit bigger than the one on those black and white tubes. And a second anode is over here. This white material you see here, this is what's called the Fritz seal. When a color picture tube is assembled, it's unlike its black and white uh, counterpart, which was typically made up as, as one piece. On the black and white tubes, they typically, um, the, the faceplate itself was usually part of the tube itself, was actually welded or, or bonded to the, the glass itself. And they, they put the phosphorus screen as a liquid so that it would, and spin it so that it would be uniform on the inside of the tube. Uh, color tubes were a little bit more complex than that and the, 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 the screen itself was typically a separate component because it has this metal shadow mask grill in there that has to be lined up with the phosphorus dots on the front. So that was made as a separate assembly and then the main bell of the tube was glued on and that's what this is, this, this, this white cement, that's actually the bonding point. It's called the Fritz seal, where the face of the CRT with the shadow mask is bonded to the bell. And this shadow mask actually would extend partly into this bell assembly here. If you've ever watched one of the videos of them uh, recycling CRTs, you'll see them actually breaking the Fritz seal. They put a, a wire around and pass an electric current through the wire that gets red hot. They can actually melt 
this bonding agent. I think it's a type of a ceramic or something they've bonded it with, but it's not like conventional glue. It's but it, uh, it's a permanent seal. And then of course, under the high vacuum of the tube, the, the um, front face plate is being pulled back. So that makes this bond very good once it sets up. I don't know, say, I don't know whether, whether it was an epoxy or what it was made out of or a ceramic. I've never uh, paid much attention to it, but anyway, that's the Fritz seal. Sometimes when a CRT failed, it would actually fail. The Fritz seal would break. It would, you'd get a little crack in the glass and it would leak and that was one of the failure modes for uh, color CRTs it didn't happen very often but in my you know my 20 year uh, career in electronics repair I saw it happen a couple times where the Fritz seal had broken usually it was a result of a, of, of a tube arcing inside and it would actually break right here and the whole front would come off you know, the tube would lose its vacuum and uh, you know, the front would fall off the set that was more uh, prevalent in the in the uh, the projection the tubes that were running really hot that used to happen on those quite a bit they'd lose their coolant again we've got a couple ceramic boards here with controls on it i'm not going to play around with those controls uh horizontal hold control horizontal uh width and or vertical width i think that's vertical does it say vertical or horizontal it says vertical linearity width this was horizontal centering. We've got our vertical hold, contrast, brightness, tint, and color controls over here on the side. And focus and screen, I've just tweaked those up. But uh, that's, that's it. I'm not going to take this thing, I don't think I'm going to take this thing apart anymore in this. I just wanted to you know, get a closer look at this, uh, this tube. And I wanted to clean that dirt which I've now got out of it. So now I can put my little collector piece back together, put it back up on the shelf. They sure made these easy to get into, just two screws. Listed home TV it says, yeah, right. How many people would be actually watching TV on one of these? I know as a kid I would have loved to have had one of these TVs. You know, that was always my wish. I could get a portable, get a portable little set, small one like this. Never got one. So I had a five-inch. That was the smallest one I ever had. Was a five-inch. I, and I think it got thrown out and it was uh, I remember leaving that at my my parents place when I moved out my mother had that in the kitchen and she used to watch the TV on it all the time and that thing got so many hours it was a citizen a little black one wish I still had it I guess it got tossed out but I uh, always keep my eyes open for another one on the back here we've got AV inputs as well as external antenna external antenna plug in there make sure this thing's all working Affairs Minister Chrystia Freeland was back in Washington for more NAFTA negotiations, and President Trump, who has trash-talked NAFTA and threatened Canada, today sounded rather positive. Canada wants to make a deal. We'll see if we can get them into the deal we already have with Mexico. Uh, I think the deal with Canada is coming along very well. We've all been dealing in good faith. That might be some relief to Freeland and the rest of the Liberal caucus. They are about to meet in Saskatoon. And our chief political correspondent, David Aiken, is there. There we go. We got it back together. You can see the individual red, green, and blue dots there on that picture. Uh, I've got the unit back together. This is with the little uh, magnifying lens on there. And as you can see, that bit of debris that had been bugging me there, I've got rid of it. It was just a bit of dirt that was trapped between the actual face of the CRT and the, the plastic uh, protection screen in front so there it is without the uh, there's without the the magnifier you can probably get the camera in even closer because I know that this camera will focus right up to the lens so you can see the dots oh. 
over 75 channels, all for only $89.95 a month. That's right. Get all a little bit of dust. Do we still have a bit of dust in there? Ah, oh, damn, I still see some dust in there. I may have to uh, take that apart again and blow it out some more. But as you can see, the resolution isn't great. Uh, it never would be on a, a set this size because they can only make those dots so small. Um, probably That was probably overriding, even though it was turned all the way, almost all the way down. But they, they can only make the... Uh, the little color dots so small on this so they weren't great for resolution you know they were better than the LCD um, screens of this size but uh, they really weren't super high resolution but just the fact that they made a one and a half inch full color tube is uh, it's actually pretty cool. And this is super rare. I think it probably it would be it would be safe to say that this is probably one of the rarest of the small CRTs. Anyway, I think it's okay now. It's it's that big blob of dirt that was bugging me that was right down about here is now gone. So and now I know how to take it apart. If I need to clean that again, it's not that hard to get in there. Two screws. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one soon. Bye.